a very very good evening to all of you friends a very very good evening to all of you a uh, welcome to byju's exam prep the most comprehensive preparation app for all exams today we look at some of the most important supreme court judgments for the year 2022 so a very very good evening to all of you friends a very warm and a hearty welcome to all of you so friends as we begin this session let me tell you that we have just a couple of days just a couple of days for elit and a, just a week more for clack <coughs> elit is scheduled on 11th so there will be a detailed analysis of elit on 11th itself on this youtube channel and on 18th of the month as you will have clat we will also have a live analysis of clat on 18th so guys let's begin with today's session wherein we shall be talking about some of the most important supreme court judgments of 2022 so the, there are a couple of judgments that i will talk to you about number one is the mahanadi coalfield judgment then is x versus the principal secretary health family welfare department then you have union of india versus ganpat delcom central bank of india versus nitin and tirumurthy fragrance versus government of nct of delhi these are some of the important judgments that i shall be traversing and talking to you about the first one is mahanadi cold beats the supreme court said that mere use of the word arbitration or arbitrator in a clause won't make it an arbitration agreement now what is arbitration now let me just give you a brief analysis of brief understanding about what is arbitration arbitration simply means arbitration simply means it's a method of out of court dispute settlement out of court dispute settlement so suppose a person suppose a company you know commercial enterprise if there is a legal dispute between two or more than two companies now they can definitely go to the court now if they go to the court what happens they spend years after years after years after years in the court there's a lot of backlogs of cases now 10 years 20 years 30 years god knows when the courts will decide so arbitration is a faster way is a faster way of solving disputes okay now what is arbitration in an agreement well, if, if two parties are entering into an agreement, a commercial agreement, they want to do something on it. And uh, in case there is any dispute, they say that it will be referred for arbitration. Now, there must be an arbitration agreement along with the main agreement. Now, the arbitration agreement would say, how will the arbitrators be appointed? Who would be the arbitrators? And henceforth. So here is a particular case wherein the Supreme Court said that the word arbitration or the word arbitrator in one particular clause of an arbitration uh, of an agreement does not make that agreement an arbitration agreement. Now the arbitration agreement must disclose as to who should be referred to in case of a dispute the arbitrator who would be the arbitrator what would be the laws that the arbitrator must follow what should be his fees everything should be disclosed in an arbitration agreement so an arbitration agreement must disclose determination and obligation on behalf of the parties referred to the dispute thereafter the supreme court in this particular case said that while there is no specific form of an arbitration agreement, the word used should disclose a determination and obligation of the parties, not merely 
contemplate the possibility of going for arbitration. So are you understanding? There must be a separate arbitration agreement attached to the main agreement for a valid arbitration to take place. Where there is merely a possibility of the parties agreeing to arbitration in future as contrasted from an obligation to refer dispute to arbitration, there is no valid and binding arbitration agreement. So just because parties have rec referred something does not mean that there is a valid and binding arbitration agreement. That agreement in, should be a separate agreement. That is what the Supreme Court says. Is that clear to each and every one of you? Is that clear to each and every one of you? Okay. Is that clear, everyone? Okay, moving on. So, in a quick class, we are going to discuss the five important judgments. We will have part two also later. Now, let's see what is an arbitration agreement. An arbitration agreement means an agreement by the parties to submit into arbitration all or certain disputes which have a reason or which may arise between them in respect of a definite legal relationship, whether contractual or not. So in case, in the event, there is a dispute between the parties, they will not go to the court they will refer this dispute for arbitration, which means an arbitrator will be appointed outside the court. He might be a former judge of the Supreme Court, former judge of a high court or a lawyer. He will decide the case. He will grant remedy to both the parties. Is that clear? Are you understanding what is an arbitration agreement, guys? Okay. Then, an arbitration agreement may be in the form of an arbitration clause in a contract or in the form of a separate agreement. Now, the Supreme Court is stressing on the fact that there might be a particular clause, there might be a separate contract, but only the word arbitration or arbitrator should not be used. It should be in the entire context. Context meaning thereby they, the, the parties to an agreement must categorically and specifically say what they intend to do in that arbitration. And thirdly, arbitration agreement shall be in writing. It cannot be oral. It cannot be. Is that clear? Because this year arbitration, you might get a passage on arbitration. So you must know what is arbitration? It is one of the alternate dispute resolution. Now, companies, their huge amount of money is stuck in the courts. So they don't want to get their money stuck in the courts for n number of years. They want fast resolution of their dispute. They want their dispute to be resolved as soon as possible. And this is a method which is legally binding under the law. Is that clear? Every one of you. Every one of you. Okay, moving on. Moving on to the next important judgment. And the next one is X versus Principal Secretary Health and Family Welfare Department. Now, the rules of which is mentioned for married woman. Now, if a married woman undergoes abortion or pregnancy, if there is a pregnancy for a woman, should that woman be discriminated on the basis whether she is married or not? The Supreme Court says that MTP rules to recognize unmarried woman's right to abortion. Now, a married woman has a right to abortion. That is there under the law. Medical termination of pregnancy rules are there. Medical termination of pregnancy rules are there. 
इन सो फार एज अबॉर्शन ऑफ मैरिड वुमेन इज कंसर्न बट द लेजिस्लेचर डिड नॉट यूज द वर्ड अनमेरिड वुमेन the legislature has not used the word unmarried woman the supreme court says that these rules must be interpreted to include married as well as unmarried women who have suffered abortion is that clear very very important now you have article 14 article 14 of the indian constitution says right to equality people should not be discriminated on the basis of caste creed religion place of birth now if you are discriminating married women and unmarried women in two different categories is it not violative of the principles of equality is it not time to ponder now according to rule 3b women who are eligible for termination of pregnancy up to 24 weeks survivors of sexual assault rape or incest minors widow divorced women with physical disability mentally ill or mentally retarded women now what unmarried woman is not there the term if an unmarried woman gets pregnant and she does not want to give birth to the child can she not have that right of course she can have that right how can you discriminate a married woman and an unmarried woman am i clear each and every one so you have over here a fantastic judgment you have over here a fantastic judgment from the supreme court of india which deals with this unusual discrimination that used to exist between a married woman and an unmarried woman the portal malfunction that has substantial risk of life of the child now if the child if the doctor says that the child might have a lifelong physical or a mental abnormality it is also a ground for abortion women with pregnancy in humanitarian settings emergency situation which may be declared by the government so during all these are the cases in which a woman is entitled for abortion these are the situation wherein a woman is entitled for abortion now what happens now what happens married woman and all these category of women they are they are they are entitled for abortion but what about unmarried woman of course if a unmarried woman does not have to have a child but she is pregnant she can have abortion within 24 weeks as per law now before uh, uh, understanding this particular judgment in detail byju's exam prep brings to you the byju's exam prep test series which has 20 45 marks 20 clat 25 non clat marks 9000 practice question test covering every sub topic three all india mega mock with video solutions detailed mock analysis and this test series are based on the actual pattern and are curated by nlu alumni get it now let's see what the supreme court says article 14 requires the state to refrain from denying to any person equality before the law or equal protection of the laws prohibiting unmarried or single parent women whose pregnancies are between 20 and 24 weeks from assessing abortion while allowing married women to assess them during the same period will fall foul of the spirit guiding article 14 very very important please understand this the fact that married women are allowed and unmarried women are not allowed would cause a problem to article 14 the spirit of article 14 that is what the supreme court says the law should not decide the beneficiary of a statute based on narrow patriarchal principle about what constitutes permissible sex which creates individuous classification and excludes groups based on their personal circumstances 
the right of reproductive autonomy, dignity and privacy under Article 21 gives an unmarried woman the right of choice whether or not to bear a child on a similar footing of an married woman. Very, very important. Are you guys understanding what the Chief Justice of India, Justice Dhananjaya Chandrachur, had to say about this particular aspect? Everyone clear? Everyone? Did you all understand? Every, each and every one of you watching me live? Very good. Very good. Justice Chandrasekhar further says that Article 51 of the Constitution requires the state to foster respect for international law. Treaties, obligation, dealings of organized people with one another. The Protection of Human Rights Act of 1993 recognizes and incorporates international convention and treaties as part of Indian human right law. Now, international law recognizes India is a part of this international society, international world. We cannot say no to what the world at large thinks and believes. Am I clear? Every one of you? Everyone? Okay. International human rights norms contained in treaties, covenants ratified by India are binding on the state to the extent that they exclude and effectuate the fundamental rights guaranteed by the constitution. So, the international law that we have ratified, we have been signatory, we have ratified, we have to follow that. That is what the constitution says, that it is the duty of the state to follow international laws. The international law does not prohibit a married or discriminate a married woman and an unmarried woman. So why should India, being a part of this larger international community, Okay. Article 6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights recognizes and protects the inherent right of life of human beings. The United, uh, the United Nations Human Rights Committee has remarked that in terms of Article 6, state parties have the responsibility to provide safe, legal and effectual access to abortion. Further, it was suggested that state parties should disseminate inequalities and evidence-based information. So quality and evidence-based information should be given precedence. And since India is a part, has been a signatory, has ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, there is this article called Article 6 which says that the state party should have the responsibility to provide safe, legal and effective access to abortion. How can you today, how can India today deny the same to a unmarried woman? Is that clear? Education about sexual and reproductive health to prevent stigmatization of women and girls seeking abortion. That is given under Article 6 of the ICCPR. Am I clear? ICCPR. Furthermore, India has ratified the International Covenant for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which enumerates in detail right to mental and physical health. The Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in their comments on Article 12 of the, uh, of the International Covenant has observed that the right to sexual and reproductive health is an integrate pa integral part of right to the highest attainability physical and mental health. 
there are international law which says that every woman should be given this right to abortion then why this right was never given to unmarried women in the first place that is what the uh, the supreme court asks and says that this is violative of right to equality am i clear international covenant for of civil and political rights iccpr International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, full form, Ishika Arora. Okay. India's obligation under the international law requires the state to bring the MTP Act in conformity with the state, uh, with the said obligation, international obligation. Reproductive rights of women must be harmonized in light of the principles laid down under the constitution as well as under the principles of international law codified under various covenants ratified by India. Our interpretation of MTP rules and the MTP Act and the rules furthers India's obligation under the international law. That is what is the judgment of the Supreme Court of India relating to this particular case at hand. Everyone, any doubts? Any doubts? So guys, if you are liking this session, do press the like button. Yes, you might get uh, uh, questions on international law as well as on abortion laws also abortion laws is very important okay yeah you might get a question okay okay uh, moving on the supreme court says that the state must act proactively in order to ensure that women in india are able to actualize their right to reproductive health and health care in line with the obligation assumed by the country under the international law. Very, very important words. Very, very important words. Okay. Next. The fourth important judgment, Union of India versus Ganpati Delcom Private Limited. The Supreme Court declares that certain section of the Benami Transaction Act is ultra-virus the constitution, is unconstitutional. Now, and it said that the Parliament made certain amendments in the year 2016. But this amendment of 2016 will only have prospective effect. It cannot be given retrospective effect. Section 3 sub clause 2. Now what is Benami transaction? Let me give you a history of Benami transaction. Now Benami transactions are transactions which are done in fictitious name. Now, after the land ceiling, now there was a point in time people used to own hundreds and hundreds of acres of lands. Now, during the agrarian reforms, the government of India came up with land ceiling act that one man cannot hold more than X amount of land. So the law was initially the Rajas and the Maharajas held huge, the zamindars held huge amount of land. Thereafter comes a ceiling that uh, one person cannot hold more than X amount of land. Now what Rajas, Maharajas, the Zamindars used to do? They used to, okay, suppose the land ceiling is one acre per person. Example, example, one acre and he has 35 acres of land. So what does he do? He keeps one acres to himself, one acres in the name of his wife, son, daughter. Then one acre in the name of his dog, one acre in the name of his servant, one acre in the name of someone who does not have any idea that one acre is given to him. 
So 35 acres is given to everyone, but he himself owns that 35 acres of land. Example. Now to stop this, the government came up with this Bename Transaction Prohibition Act of 1988. Now section 3.2 of this 2016 amendment the Supreme Court says is unconstitutional because it is violative of 20 subclause 1 of the Constitution. Now, what does 3 2 say? Says that whoever enters into any Benami transaction shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to three years or with fine or both. Now, this Benami transaction amendment the parliament said would act retrospectively from 1988 onwards. The Supreme Court says it cannot be applied retrospectively. It cannot be at now. Now, criminal law can only be prospective in nature. Now, suppose Mr. A commits an offense today, commits an act today, which is not an offense. After two years, the government declares that it is an offense. After two years. Now, can he be prosecuted? Now, there was a particular law that was made retrospectively applicable. That cannot happen. How will I be knowing that tomorrow the government will come up? Now, suppose tomorrow the government comes up with a law that says that online education is a crime. Example. Now, can I be prosecuted? No. Because when I am doing it, it is not a crime. Tomorrow, if it is a crime, I cannot be prosecuted for it. Criminal law must be prospective in nature. It cannot be applied retrospectively. Am I clear? Every one of you. Am I clear? Every one of you. Okay, any doubts? Any doubts? The 2016 amendment which came into effect from November 2016 uh, explained that scope of Bename transaction such as property transaction which is made in fictitious name, name of a dog, name of the cat, name of an animal, you know, you have so much of land that you cannot keep it in your name. So you give it in the name of the, your pet dog. You know, your pet dog belongs to you. He cannot claim that land. The owner is not aware or denies knowledge of the ownership of the property. You give that property in the name of Ram Yadav. Ra, no, I don't know. There might be some Ram Yadav, but he does not exist in this world. Giving it to you that name. Person providing the consideration for the property is not traceable. You, you are giving it to a person who is not traceable. Now that means the real thing belongs to you. You are giving your land to someone for, you are selling your land for rupees 10 to some fictitious man. Or the person who does not have any knowledge that the ownership has come to him. Now this, for this, this Benami Transaction Prohibition Act came into being. So guys, before moving ahead, Baiju's exam prep brings to you this last lap for CLAT 2023. 25 power pack sessions. Those who have not watched it, go and watch it. Must to do topics, practice question, practice solving skills and tips. So the Supreme Court says that in view of the above discussion, we hold section 3 sub clause 2 of the unamended 1988 act is unconstitutional being arbitrary section th 3 sub clause 2 of the 2016 act is also unconstitutional because it is only because it was talking about retrospective effect you cannot give a retrospective effect to a criminal law because it violates 20 sub clause 1 of the constitution in REM forfeiture provision under Section 5 of the unamended Act of 18, 1988 prior to the 2006 amendment was also declared 
unconstitutional. Now, the law said that if you commit benami, all your land will be taken away. Now, that is wrong. All your land will be taken away. Now, there must be some kind of punishment, but the punishment is, cannot be arbitrary. Has to be organic. The 2016 Amendment Act was not merely procedural, rather prescribed substantive provision. In REM forfeiture, which was given under Section 5 of the Act, being punitive in nature, can only be applied prospectively and not retrospectively. Now, a, a law that punishes a particular individual, a law that punishes a particular individual cannot be retrospective in nature. It can only be prospective in nature. Am I clear? Have I made myself clear to each and every one of you? Have I made myself clear to each and every one of you? Any doubts? Okay. Concern authority, the Supreme Court says, concern authorities cannot initiate or continue criminal prosecution or confiscation proceeding for transaction enter into prior to the 2000 Act. So prior to 25, 10, 2016, you cannot touch a man for having committed that offense because that offense became an offense in 2016. So all prosecutions which were initiated or an acts committed prior to 25 10 2016 stands squashed. Am I clear? Very, very important. So a law that punishes a human being, you might get a passage on a law that punishes a human being is given a retrospective effect. Does it violate Article 20 sub clause 1? This court is not concerned with the constitutionality of such independent forfeiture proceeding contemplated under the 2016 Act on other grounds. The aforesaid question is left open to be adjudicated in appropriate proceedings. So you don't need to know about this thing. Okay, you're not, not much required. Now let's see the relevant provision. Benami transaction. Prohibition of Benami transaction, right? Section 3. No person shall enter into any Benami transaction. Nothing in subclause 1 shall apply to, very important, purchase of property by any person in the name of his wife. Now, can't I buy something in the name of my wife? Can't I buy something in the name of my unmarried daughter? Now, people buy gold for their unmarried daughter. People buy flats, apartments for their wives. Now, bringing daughter and wife under this purview would be little difficult. Okay, very well. You are giving things in the name of fictitious people. That is illegal. Very well. But what about wife and unmarried daughter? The security is held by a depository registered owner now suppose you buy some shares or stocks or mutual fund investment in the name of your unmarried daughter or in the name of your wife how is it wrong keep that in your mind okay is that clear everyone is that clear to each and everyone okay Punishment provided under subclause 3. Whoever enters into any Benami transaction shall be punished with an imprisonment for which may extend up to 3 years or with fine or both. Nature of the act provided notwithstanding anything contained in the CRPC an offence under this section shall be non-cognizable and bailable. So it is bailable. Now why did the Supreme Court held it to be unconstitutional? Read this. No person shall be convicted of an offence 
except for violation of a law in force at the time of commission of the act. So, if the act is not an offense on a particular date and you commit that act, can you be prosecuted? Nor be the subject to penalty greater than that which might have been inflicted under the law. You cannot be given more punishment than what is given under the law at that point in time. Is that clear? Every one of you. So guys, if you are liking this session, what are you doing? You have to like. Is that clear? Okay, everyone. Okay, 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 good. Then you have Central Bank of India versus Nitin. And this deals with compassionate appointment. This particular thing came in this year, last to last year. The Supreme Court held that financial criteria in a compassionate appointment cannot be ignored. Now, what is the reason behind giving compassionate appointment? Now, suppose a person has a wife, has a son or a daughter. He is the sole bread earner of the family. Now, suppose he dies. Then the law says that a compassionate appointment can be given to the wife or the child or the son or the daughter. So that the because the fact that the sole bread earner died, the entire family will should not go for hunger. Am I clear? Very simple. Very, very simple. The financial criteria of compassionate appointment given in a compassionate appointment scheme cannot be ignored. So the financial criteria of an individual should not be ignored. That is what the Supreme Court says. Rules which provide for financial criteria for appointment on compassionate grounds have to be construed strictly. Otherwise, the quota reserved for compassionate appointment would be filled by excluding others who might be in greater or more acute financial distress. Now, if you are opening up compassionate appointment quota to everyone, you have to categorize who really requires that job? Who is really, really, really in that financial distress? Am I clear? Have I made myself clear? Is that clear? Every one of you. Okay. Before moving on so these are uh, certain classes that we had in the last lap to clat 2023 those who all of you who have missed it do go through these youtube sessions they are there on our youtube platform the supreme court said that it is well settled that compassionate appointment is an exception to the rule of equality which enables very important the dependent family members of a medically incapacitated employee who has no option but to retire or a deceased employee to tide over the immediate crisis caused by the incapitation or death of the breadwinner. If the sole breadwinner of the family dies or due to some medical incapacity, he is unable to work. Should the entire family die out of hunger? The Supreme Court says no. Should not be done. But while granting compassionate appointment, you should give to those who really, really, really requires it. Compassionate appointment excludes equality or more meritorious candidate, but in need of a job from the zone of consideration. 
consideration for compassionate appointment must therefore be strictly in accordance with the prevalent rules for compassionate appointment applicable to the deceased permanent prematurely retired employees owing to medical incapacity is that clear every one of you so guys if you are liking this session do press the like button do press the like button if you are liking this session okay okay great great the supreme court again says that in this case there is a financial criteria of eligibility of compassionate appointment under the compassionate appointment schemes rules which provide for a financial criteria for appointment of compassionate appointment grounds are valid and lawful are valid and lawful which have to be construed strictly as otherwise the quota reserved for the compassionate appointment would be filled up excluding others who might be in greater and more acute financial distress so fine people who are in financial distress who are in financial distress they should be given priority financial distress should be one of the criteria for awarding compassionate appointment Article 14, the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or equal protection of the laws. You cannot discriminate a person on the ground of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth. Okay. The next important judgment. Very interesting. Suppose there is a seven judge judgment and there is a five judge judgment now suppose all the five judges over here is unanimous five is to one five is to zero and suppose there's a seven judge bench which has given four is to three judgment and if they are contradicting which will prevail over the other which will prevail over the other the Supreme Court says judgment delivered by a larger bench will prevail over a one delivered by a smaller bench irrespective of the number of judges that constituted majority. This is now over here if you see calculate the numbers five is more than four. Now suppose this five judge bench and there is a seven judge bench. Seven judge bench gave a judgment on four is to three and there's a five judge bench which has given five is to zero now in this case which will prevail this will prevail this judgment of the squad will prevail concurrence of majority of judges is considered judgment of the opinion of the court now judgment of seven judges bench with four is to three majority will prevail over unanimous judgment by five judge bench am i clear you have to look at the total number of judges you should not look at how many judges said yes and how many judges said no in the ews judgment five judge two judges said no three judges said ews reservation is constitutionally valid you should not look at three judges you should look at five judge bench that's it Am I clear? All of you. If a unanimous five judge bench decision is overruled by a seven judge bench with four learned judges speaking for the majority, the three learned judges speaking for the minority, can it be said that the five judge bench has been overruled? Under the present practice, it is clear that the view of the four learned judges speaking for the majority of seven judge bench 
will prevail over a unanimous five judge bench decision because they happen to speak for all the seven judges very interesting very important a landmark judgment by justice indira banerji a landmark judgment by justice indira banerji uh, and it's of a constitution bench did you all understand now all of you okay Has the time come to tear the judicial will and hold that in reality a view of five learned judges cannot be overruled by a view of four learned judges speaking for a seven judge bench? This is the question which also needs to be answered and addressed and answers. That is what uh, Justice Indira Banerjee says. So you can, in case there is a unanimous five judge judgment and a seven judge bench which has majority and minority you should not look at how many judges gave the majority view you should look at the what is the total strength of the judges okay okay what is precedent a judgment delivered by a larger bench will prevail irrespective of the number of judges constituting the minority view in view of article 4 145 sub clause 4 of the constitution Concurrence of the majority of the judges at the hearing will be considered as a judgment. Concurrence of the majority of the judges at the hearing will be considered as a judgment. So that is a precedent or opinion of the court. It is settled, very, very important. It is settled that majority decision of a bench of larger strength would prevail over a decision of a bench of lesser strength irrespective of the number of judges constituting the majority irrespective of the number of judges constituting the majority so that is in crux what the supreme court constitution bench had to say relating to this uh, dispute can a seven judge bench overrule a five judge bench when five judge bench unanimously spoke and the seven judge bench there was a four is to three majority right very important so guys how was this session tell me how was this session did you like it if you have liked it do press the like button so guys we are there of course on 11th we will have a live session on the analysis of ALIT and on 18th we shall have a live session on CLAT as well. Do subscribe and press the bell icon. Do follow us on our Instagram, like our Facebook page. Do join our Telegram channel and just do not forget to download the Baidu's exam prep app. A lot of stuff is provided free of cost. With this, all the very best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Good night. All the very best for your ALIT examination on uh, on eleventh uh, of the month. All the very best. God bless you guys. God bless you. All the best. All the best. Bye bye.